think those of us who participate in this class know to get to that level. You're pretty special, special students. This scholarship program is an academic competition for recognition and scholarships that began in 1955. High school students enter the National Merit Program by taking the preliminary SAT and the National Merit <coughs> Scholarship qualifying test and by meeting published entry and participation requirements. So with that, um, if we could have uh, Ellie and Allison come forward. And if I'm, I'm gonna ask all the board members to just go across the front, please. <coughs> Al, by the way. Al? Yeah, thank I'm you. Sorry, Al. Sorry. <laughs> Al. Oh, and it's a. Uh, is it misspelled? Yes. Well, we'll get a new one, right? Oh, we'll get thank a new you. one. But you take this for the photo ops. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> congratulations on the Apple board. Thank you. And Allison, congratulations on the Apple board to spell that. Yes. Okay. Very good. <laughs> congratulations. Thank you. We'd like to uh, have you go across here and. Everyone, please join me in recognizing you. Congratulations. Congratulations. We'll get that. Thank you. All right. uh, we're going to have a board stay here because we're going to recognize some additional students. We're recognizing uh, DeKalb students in the VCP SAFE program. This has been our community for many, many years. It's been an excellent program. And uh, we're actually going to have a couple of our students talk about it. But the Board of Education will recognize the following DCP SAFE high school students. Amanda Hedberg, our co-president. Sammy Coakley, the other co-president. Abby Kuzman, Kuzmik, is that correct? Close. Angelica Garcia, Courtney Donnelly, Kristen Johnson, Ashley Lorenz, and Kelsey Grubbs. Please join me in welcoming them to the front. Hand you your certificates, and at that time, I'm going to introduce their uh, sponsor, instructor, Mr. Waymeyer, and he will introduce a couple of our speakers. Amanda, <laughs> congratulations! <laughs> and we'll just have you go down and shake everyone's hand. Mm -hmm. Abby, she isn't here. Yeah. Abby's not here. Okay. <laughs> Angelica, <laughs> Angelica, congratulations on behalf of the board. Courtney? She is here. <laughs> That's okay. Kristen. Kristen Johnson. Kristen, congratulations on the Board of Education. Congratulations. Ashley Lorenz. Ashley, congratulations on the Board. Right now, she's here. Samantha Copley. Samantha, congratulations on the Board. Oh, yeah. And Kelsey Grubbs, congratulations on the Happy Board. Thank you. Okay, board members, let's sit down, and then I'm going to let Mr. Waymeyer take over here. <coughs> well, first of all, uh, Mr. Lord's daughter is also in the group, Madison. She's not here tonight because she had. I think of an engagement or she had volleyball. Volleyball, so that was important, so she couldn't be here tonight either. Um, but first of all, I'm Dennis Flamer. I'm one of the school counselors at the high school. And about three years ago, when I first started at DeKalb, Dr. Moeller came to me and said, uh, you know, you were working with boys and girls clubs for all those years. I think you'd be good at working with this group. I had no idea what the group was going to be about and what we were going to do. But it has been an awesome thing for me to be a part of because I get to work with some of these awesome students who are really doing a good thing in our community and that's helping our students understand about uh, the risk of doing risky behavior like drugs and alcohol, um, 
safe driving, texting and driving, things like that. But this particular group this year is challenging me to do even more. And so I am really excited that they're being acknowledged tonight. And so I'm going to let the co-presidents kind of talk about what they're wanting to do this year because they have some really lofty ideas. And, and I, I know that uh, our uh, that Tamara has been really excited about what they're going to do. They've met with her, and we're not going to we're not going to have any excuses. They're going to get what they need to get done this year and do what's best for our high school students and help them make really good choices this year. So if I could just have um, Sammy and Amanda, the rest of you, if you want to go ahead and sit down, you can do that. And they're going to talk about those things real quick that we're going to be doing this year. Well, I'm Sammy. I'm one of our co-presidents, and I'm first just going to talk a little about what DCP SAFE is. It stands for DeKalb County Partnership for a Safe and Active Family Environment, and our mission is to improve the environment of our school and our community by encouraging healthy choices and lifestyles. Like you said, some of our main focus has been on underage drinking, texting and driving, and the use of tobacco, and this year we're actually also going to do a lot with this drug hookah and make sure that people know like what it is because a lot of high schoolers are using this drug often and I don't think that they realize what they're putting into their bodies so we're going to make sure that they do. Um, some of our major plans, our first one is the week of October 23rd to 31st, that's our Red Ribbon Week, which discourages substance abuse. So throughout the week we're going to be having students sign pledges to be drug free. And to kind of end that on a high note, at the, at, during that weekend of October 26th, we're going to have a drug-free movie night. Um, and our next big plan is going to be in April, which we're going to make pinwheels for Child Abuse Awareness Month, because pinwheels are the symbol of child abuse. Um, and then our biggest hope for this year is to do a prom demonstration, which they did in Sycamore last year, and it worked really well. We're going to attempt to stage a real drunk driving accident with some of our actual students to kind of show the dangers of drunk driving and the harsh realities of it. <coughs> and then um, to wrap up the year, our last hope is if this movie night goes well, to do one other movie night. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Wayway, thanks for your leadership on the program, for your students, for volunteering your time to participate in this. Thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we move on to acceptance of gifts and donations, and it is uh, with uh, great pleasure that the Board of Education accept the gratitude of the donation of $10,000 from an anonymous donor to our district for students with special needs. Uh, do we have a motion to accept this? So moved. And second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Again, uh, with our deepest gratitude. Thank you. Public comment. We do have one card. Members of the public who wish to speak to the board should complete a request card prior to the meeting. This section of the meeting will be reserved for comments from the public. All comments should be limited to three minutes and criticism of individuals is not in order. Uh, Carrie Malott. Uh, Carrie lives on Malta Road. Thank you. Yours, Carrie. Um, I have a couple of free comments here. I'll try to make it quick. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the board of administration for the online backup material. I looked at it today for the first time in depth and it's very, very helpful. Uh, I looked at the uh, newspaper this morning and saw the article about the land swap, and uh, there wasn't much in that article, but there was quite a bit in the backup material, so that's very helpful. Uh, I'll get to that again in a moment about the land swap, but before that, uh, first on the agenda is the uh, radios. That's an issue that's been uh, something in my mind ever since uh, the last election before this board was configured as it is now, uh, and I brought to the board's attention back then that I wasn't convinced that things were as they should be, uh, that turned out to be the case, and I just want to remind the board that those Starcom radios are very expensive, the ones that turned out not to be needed. And I certainly hope you do your utmost to try and get money back on those radios. I see it was 40000 or something to that effect for these new motor turbos. Uh, perhaps some of that money at least can be uh, compensated by uh, getting rid of those unnecessary expensive Starcom radios. So I know Tammy's been working on that. I, I look forward to seeing the outcome. Uh, now to the land swap. Um, I feel like I'm getting the cart in front of the horse here uh, because Dr. Briscoe is going to present something about this tonight, and I don't want to speak out of turn. Uh, but with help from the backup materials, uh, I'm concerned about a couple of things. I'd rather do this interactively, but I know this board's 
policy is to speak now and, and not later. So uh, I'm concerned mostly about the loss in the value of the land down on Fairview. Uh, that was purchased for about 1.4 million, and it looks like from the backup material, we're getting 600 some odd thousand for it. That's a huge loss. Uh, that leads me to wonder about the appraisals. This building was appraised for over a million dollars, but there's questions about how much is it really worth. In any event, with respect to the land on Fairview, um, I'm not quite sure I can imagine a 50% loss in value, or more than 50%, even in this uh, difficult recession. Uh, and because of a question in my mind about that, I just advised the board and, and asked that the board move slowly, cautiously on this. Uh, it may or may not be a good thing, I don't know, I'm, I'm waiting to hear the details. But uh, I'm, I'm also concerned with, uh, along with that uh, possible loss in, in value to the district, uh, further inequity across the schools. Uh, swapping that land in Fairview for land next to the high school may or may not be a good thing, I'm not going to judge that until I hear everything, but certainly it has potential to create further inequity when we have many, many schools that need all kinds of work and perhaps uh, expansion, perhaps even some point in the future, another school like Portland, a large four-section school to the west end of the district. Uh, again, I'm very, uh, I'm just wondering, you know, whether or not that particular land swap is the best thing, and and how that value can be uh, distributed across the whole district. So those are just my concerns. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate that. Okay, we'll move on to our non-business consent agenda. Uh, it's been recommended that the Board of Education approve non-business consent agenda items A through F. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call? Wait. Oh, excuse me? For B on that item, there is a request for human resources, the personnel demographic report. It still wasn't in there. It, I can't see. It's, it's on, the agenda, on, it's on yeah. the agenda tonight. It'll be. Connie, Connie's going to be talking about it. Uh, Towards the end, new business D. There's going to be a presentation. Okay, right. Right. Okay. okay, I want to see. Sorry. No problem. Roll call, please. Cohen Barnes? Yes. Mimi Fontana? Yes. Michael Ward? Yes. Jessica Lyons? Yes. Tom Matia? Yes. Mike Lerbeck? Yes. Tracy Williams? Yes. Okay, as you may recall, a meeting or two ago, Tammy came and uh, talked about uh, submitting, uh, going out submitting bids for backup uh, snow removal. She has done that. And uh, there's been a motion brought forward in the material that the Board of Vacation award a contract for backup snow removal services to Dean Ryan Tree Landscaping, LLC 17271 Route 23 Calvo and Moy for the 2012-13 winter season. Uh, we have a motion to approve this. So moved. We have a second. Second. Discussion? Tammy, I do believe we had um, two bids that I saw in the material. Okay. And uh, this was clearly the lower one. Absolutely. And this is a gentleman that we've had as our backup person before. He was our, provided our backup <coughs> services last year by contract. We didn't need to use the services throughout the last winter season. And with any luck, we may be able to continue this, this coming year without using them. But we do need to have it in place just in the event. The previous years, we did contract out some of the services, so he was our contractor. I believe it was for two to three years prior to that, um, and did an excellent job for us at that time. Okay. Any questions for him? Roll call, please. Nina Fontana? Yes. Michael Lord? Yes. Jessica Lyons? Yes. Tom Matia? Yes. Mike Burbick? Yes. Tracy Williams? Yes. Juan Barnes? Yes. Um, Tammy also gave us an update on this proposal at our last meeting and an update of the process of how she was going to do this, I think back in our August meeting, uh, the approval of a two-way radio communication proposal. Uh, it's been recommended uh, that the Board of Education approve the purchase of 102 Motorola XPR 3300TRPO portable radios at a cost not to exceed $44,000 from Dixon Auto Communications Incorporated. In addition to the 44000 administration recommends that the board approve $2,000 of contingency funds for the purchase of earpieces for security staff and administration. Uh, Tammy, do you want to talk a little bit about the process you went through and 
how you guys just considered before we enter a motion. Absolutely. Um, we had a committee put together this year, um, consisting of Connie Roman, Brian Tobin, and myself, to interview some, several vendors um, in the area and in the area and out, I will say. And through process of elimination in regards to service they can provide, the radio that can be used within our own infrastructure, as well as um, the previous service we've actually received from Dixon Ottawa. The decision was made to recommend Dixon Auto Communications. Um, as you may know, they were our previous provider when we bought the Moto Turbos last year. It, it has changed ownership. The previous owner did retire and sell out to Matt Beck, who is present from Dixon Ottawa, as well as two more individuals from the company. One is Kevin. Kevin has been actually our service tech for the entire process and has been extremely helpful and responsive to any of our requests from a service standpoint and designed our current infrastructure that works very well with our digital and our analog radios and the programming that was needed. Um, and so with the change of ownership and the most recent presentations, we are making a recommendation to continue with the Dixon Ottawa services and also the purchase of the additional radios. Connie and I had the opportunity to meet with every principal in the district to identify how many radios were actually needed in each building. Um, we have been dealing with analog radios, the ICOMs, that have been working in conjunction with our, our 100 motor turtles that we have on hand for the past year. It's not an ideal situation. The communication is limited within buildings and the ICOMs don't communicate back throughout the district. That, along with the FCC mandate that is in effect as of December 31st, the ICOM radios can no longer be used after December 31st, so we were forced to look to, to purchase digital radios to replace those analogs. In the reviews which within each principal meeting, we were able to identify who, who critically needs them within the building. And in that same time, we also identified which positions were needed because of um, services that were offered through our support services team members. Um, because of students' needs, med medically fragile students, behaviorally challenged students, some of those teachers have to have a radio on their hip at all times so they can have immediate communication back to the office. Um, for that reason, out of the 102 that we're recommending <coughs> purchasing, 26 of them are actually student services for student service reasons. And I've, we've had conversations with Jessica Stewart, and I've identified that, that their budget is able to absorb the cost of those 26 radios since that is the purpose of buying them is for that department. This will give us approximately seven extra radios to have on hand. As we know, once we roll them out, there's going to be somebody that was just missed in the process and is going to need a radio right away. So that's where the recommendation for the 102 is coming. Tammy, could you <coughs> explain, I don't know the exact numbers, but from when this was presented to the board, and we said go back, go back to the drawing board last spring. Mm -hmm. The price has come down significantly. Yes, it Can has. Can you explain why? Absolutely. A year ago, um, we did not have the option to purchase the current radios that we are recommending today. The radios that we have on staff now, the motor turbos that we currently have, have a keyboard and a screen to the front. Of, and the new radios that we're proposing are about half the cost. They don't have a screen. They don't have the, the keys on the front. But there really isn't a need for that. We've determined in, in the process of, because the radios we're purchasing will be used by staff that are really only working within the building their work they're at. They're not maintenance staff or administration that are floating between buildings and may have to switch channels frequently. They will go to a channel and they're going to stay on that channel pretty much indefinitely. But they would have the option to be able to switch channels should the need arise or we need to transfer a radio to another building. Um, that gives us that flexibility um, to, to do that, but still gives us the reduced cost of almost $400 of each radio to go with this lower end model. They're still Motorola's. They are still 16 channel units, just like the, the current systems we have. And I will say in the current radios that we use, we don't use the keyboard. That screen is nice for a person like me who switches between channels quite frequently throughout the day. It's a convenience factor. But it's not a necessity when we're looking at saving four hundred dollars a radio, and we're buying a hundred of them. Other questions, Mike? You went through and you tried to figure out how many of the analogs we don't really need going forward. How many do you think we eliminated during the process? That's a really good question. Over the past year, we've been pretty free about when principals have requested an analog radio. We've had quite a bit extra on stock. 
in stock because the high school, all of theirs were turned over to us because they had to go completely digital when we opened. So if I were to guesstimate, I would say we reduced our count by at least 50, possibly upwards of 75, because we were actually, our guess when we were going into this, was we were gonna be looking to purchase around 150 to 200 radios instead of 102 that we came up with. And I'll say the principals were excellent in their, their meetings with us to identify radios that could be shared between positions. For example, morning and even afternoon bus duty safety monitors are sharing with the lunch duty staff or they're using the after school let, uh, bus duty are using the PE radios because at the end of the day, the PE staff doesn't need their radios. So we were able to identify in main offices. Yes, the principal has one, the nurse has one, but the, the secretarial staff or the office staff, they have one. They don't need one sitting on everybody's desk pretty much collecting desks throughout the day. So they were very cooperative in coming up with those numbers. Um, getting back to Mr. Malat's point, mm -hmm. the uh, radios that I believe were approved in April of 2010, yes. those were the new radios for the high school, is that correct? In April 2011, we actually purchased um, 100, approximately 100 motor turbos that were for the high school, as well as the maintenance and ground staff, all principals, and one for each main office, and then um, for the education center staff that were identified. The high school had to have that, because with their, all the brick and mortar out of that building, you can't, I mean, as some of you may know, you can barely get a cell signal, let alone a radio transmission through those walls. So we didn't have any options. So there's not a cheaper alternative to those, looking specifically at the Dixon people? To the ones we have at the high school? Right. The, that alternative is what we're buying now for the rest of the staff. If we should deem it appropriate, we can replace some of those that are at the high school with this lower end radio and give the higher end radio to individuals that we feel need the option of the screens and uh, with that. Because from a standpoint of coverage, it provides the same same uh, coverage and frequency issues or frequency that it does on the low end versus the high end radio. It's just the options that cost another $400, which is really what it comes down to. Other questions for and I'll do a quick one. I appreciate representation from the vendor coming out to the meeting. I think that's always a good sign of a company that's willing to back its product, answer questions as they come up. So thank you for coming out tonight. Um, two, just so I heard you right, there was a recommendation of 150 plus radios. And during the vetting process, you realized the 102 is really what we need. <coughs> we were just guesstimating at 150 <coughs> going into this process. When we had meet, met with each of the vendors, we told them it could be anywhere from 100 to 200 radios because we hadn't had those meet principal meetings with the principals. So they each kept, gave us a quote based on 100 and then also it told us, and uh, Matt, for example, came back and said if it's 125, the price may go down. If it, and at that time of our meetings, we also weren't aware of what rebate programs were going to be offered through Motorola because every, I believe it's quarter, new, new promotions are offered. And this promotion that was rolled out on September 10th, I believe, uh, gives us $185 back on every six radios we purchase, which is why the n number I'm asking for is 102. Because we were a little more rebated, we looked at buying two more. Just to rephrase my question then, the amount of radios that were requested by district, ah. you ended up reducing them through your meetings, or is the amount that was requested what's, what's before us right now? I would say we were pretty close to what, when they when we walked in the meetings, we really didn't change their numbers too dramatically from what the principals originally submitted. They were very reasonable going into this and had a good understanding of, we're not looking to give you radios that sit on somebody's desk for six out of the eight hours a day. So I would say most of those meetings we walked out providing them the, actually the number of radios they requested. Sometimes we might have made some switches of who's getting them. They may have asked for some for staff that after further discussion we identified those staff didn't necessarily need them, but other staff, for example, PE teachers who take classes out of the building and away from any type of any communication source did need them, and it hadn't been thought about in the process. Jessica, do you have I did. Um, you said that we had purchased 100 for DHS, correct? No, for DHS we actually let me verify my numbers here. We were closer to 35 initially, and now they have 38. Okay, I thought 
hung around and you said that we had a hundred. So that's why I was like, this is discrep you know, there's a discrepancy between the report then. No, the hundred that we purchased back in April of 2011 was 100 for the entire district. Okay. 38 of those were assigned directly to the high school for all of their needs, mm -hmm. and the rest were for maintenance and ground staff, okay. staff at the center. So that's center. why you have 97, and then four were transferred. Correct, and those four actually came missing. from the education center. We identified some departments that didn't necessarily, or positions that didn't need to have uh, Motor Trouble Radio on their desk. I, my office sits right in the middle. I will always have the spares on chargers, so should the need arise at the Ed Center, anyone can go into my office and, and grab a spare radio rather than designating a person or to have a radio sitting on their desk. So that's where those four came from. And we did go into it last year, wanting one for every principal and one for every main office because they were the best quality communication piece of the time for crisis situations. And we were having issues with crisis situations, especially at our Courtland and Malta facilities because um, the repeaters were not transmitting the signals properly. On an, on an analog basis. Actually, I have one more, if you don't mind. <laughs> I kind of mind. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> just, just, to, just to clarify in my mind, if I remember right last time, there was a proposal for, I mean, it was, it was huge. Yes. We said go back to the drawing board. And a solution was come came up where we could reprogram some of the radios and it ended up being a fraction of the cost to accomplish the need at the time. Yes. <laughs> if that's the premise, how do we know the similar thing is not possible right now? Did, was that taken into consideration? Can I vote yes on this and know that we're not repeating what we could have done last, or what we did last time, but we could do it this time? Sure. Uh, how do I feel confident that that has happened, that due diligence has been done? The programming that was done last year to make this work without spending another, at that time was proposed, was another $100,000 on top of the initial purchase. That was done to all of the analog radios by Kevin um, through putting in additional repeaters, programming so that they talk the analogs at certain buildings can talk to the digitals at those buildings, being the principal and the office staff, but can't talk <coughs> to anyone else. Those analogs, they have to be recycled as of December 31st based on the FCC mandate. Our ICOM analog radios are not compatible with the mandate that's coming down on December 31st, so we don't have the option of continuing their use because of this FCC mandate. Yes? Go ahead, I know you mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just um, want everyone to be able to sleep at night. Yeah, so. So, <laughs> right. Well, not that we haven't been radio. talking about the radio for the last what are we doing with all the old ones? Can we sell them? Can we, what can we do with those? We can't sell them. They, they will be recycled. We can't sell them. They, they will be recycled. We will be turning them over to Dixon Ottawa, who will be stripping all of the frequency and drilling a hole in them, as far as I have been told. Um, to make sure that they can't get out and be used out in the public because um, if you remember there with the FCC mandate if those are keyed up if the yeah. button is pushed after December 31st there are fines upwards of $7,000 a day they will track us for three days and then tell us we owe $21,000 and they're looking to use this money the FCC as a, a funding source for their department is what um, has been shared with us so they're actually just waiting to catch people like this <laughs> so we don't want to be that and so we do plan to roll this out upon board approval if we're on schedule so by December 30, 30 excuse me December 1st we are 100% over to digital which gives us the month of December to search for all these analog radios that people have hidden under their desk and in their corners and <laughs> throughout their buildings because there are there are still out there. There are maybe some maybe, out there that we Maybe we should all carry a drill with us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See when we a hammer. <laughs> <laughs> but Tammy, first I want to thank you and Kai for your work on this and uh, coming up with a better alternative. <laughs> My last question is, is this the last time we're going to see this as an agenda yeah. item for a while? Well, you'll be staying at the next meeting for official approval. Today okay. is strictly informational. I'd love you guys to approve it today if you'd like. I'd rather not be talking about this. But actually, I, I thought it was brought to uh, it, is, it says action and information. So, so moved. Okay. Any additional discussion? I just have one comment. Thanks, Tammy. This is the best most important discussion we've heard on radio since we got here. So I thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. Who's seconded? Jessica, okay. quickly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, could we have roll call, please? Yeah. 
Michael Lloyd? Yes. Jessica Lyons? Yes. Tom Tia? Yes. Mike Herbert? Yes. Tracy Williams? Yes. Colin Barnes? Yes. Nina Fontana? Yes. Motion carries. And Tammy, nothing personal. You're always welcome to our board meetings. Come speak. All right. Thank you. Okay. Just not about radio. Just not about radio. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Justin. <laughs> okay. Uh, we're going to move into our new business part of the agenda. And as you know, on our uh, thank you, gentlemen, for coming out. Thank you. Uh, as you know, we have a discussion item, uh, informational item, <coughs> a proposed land spot. And before I turn it over to Dr. Briscoe, I just would like to kind of walk through the process of how we got to this point. I believe it was in November of last year, in which, uh, in, in ways in which we're trying to find. Um, the best use for our assets that we have and how we can use those to potentially reduce uh, future burden on the district and to reduce uh, some of our some of our uh, deficit. We did an appraisal not only on this facility here, but then we also did an appraisal on the land on Fairview. And after that point, uh, knowing that uh, the likelihood that we would ever do uh, an expansion onto Huntley Middle School uh, and the fact that uh, uh, we already are potentially uh, confined in our land around the high school uh, at some future point, whether it's 10, 15, or 20 years from now, uh, there may be a need to do something, as it was with the old high school, because that was added on two or three times. Uh, so at that point, uh, we asked Dr. Briscoe to uh, engage in some discussions with a local developer, our neighbor, um, out by our new high school facility. And uh, Dr. Briscoe tonight is going to talk about that. Uh, the material you can be reviewing, it's right behind you. So please kind of, you know, it's a little bit awkward, but turn your chair and Dr. Briscoe, it's over to you. Thank you. Um, uh, the reason that we want to have you watch this some of the visuals will really really give you an idea of what we're actually talking about i think we got a couple good shots that you'll have a, a good review so um like mr machia said uh we evaluated our assets yeah the board of education um back in april asked us to uh, appraise not only this property but the property we were sitting on over by fairview and the appraisal came in and you can see that up there. Um, the, I just put the edge center here was appraised at 1.4, and the property at Fairview was appraised at $15,000 per acre, which is exactly 41.6 acres. And in 2002, that same $625,000 was purchased for $1,457,000. I think it's important, Gary, you brought that point up, so I think it's important to remember that. So from there, the Board of Education made a logical request. Well, what can we do with our assets? You know, what what's in the best interest long term of the district? And and we don't have cash on hand in terms of we know we have the reserves, but but that that's being utilized by the FFAC to come up with how to do things with other facilities like like Terry brought up. So what we did. So what, what, what I want to give you a visual before I, I talk about when we approach show, uh, show e development was the property we're actually talking about is right here is Huntley Middle School, the old high school. And so you have 4th Street and Fairview. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of diagram of the property that was purchased back in 2002. And this is the 41 acres, 41.46 acres. So this, this is the piece of property that we suggested we swap with Shogin development up at the new high school. And the rationale behind this originally was just that we feel in the long term there were no long term plans for this area, but in the long term we felt there could be a real value that I'll talk a little bit about at the new high school. So I'll show you the property. This is a pretty good view. Um, one of our teachers took this, I think Isabel took this picture, and I was looking real hard for a picture that would really give you a good vantage point of, of how much property is actually out there. 
Roger, you sort of know because you live right there. But uh, this is one of the new high schools being developed. And the property we're discussing um, swapping is this area back in here, which would square off. This is uh, Pride Drive here. And we would square this off up here. It would come down all the way to Dresser. So the district would pick up this property. And you can see where all the development would take place then with, uh, with uh, Shodin development. And Dave Patsell's here tonight who represents Shodin. So he may comment as we get moving on. So I'll show you just a little bit, a better diagram of what that land might look like in terms of the acreage. This isn't a real good picture, that's why I wanted to show you the other one, but this is the school site right now. And so this would be, we would pick up 33.46 acres, and that land really extends out to here, but this was the best that we could put together. But I wanted you to have another perspective of the property um, that we were looking at swapping. So, so I, I wanted everyone here tonight to have a real visual of what we were talking about. So with that said, the rationale for the land swap was simple to us, was there was a need for additional property at, at DHS. We actually, in 09, when we worked, went towards annexation, we met with Shodin and tried to purchase more property. It just didn't work out at that time. And so we still feel we have the same need. Um, we feel the land at DHS provides for future options for the school district. There's a lot of potential for expansion for educational programs, future growth in parking, busing, and again, the current location at DHS is landlocked, as you saw on the last slide. So, so that, that's the rationale, that you got land sitting over here, 41 acres, that, that there's really no future plans for. And I want you to remember something about Huntley Middle School that right now we have about 800 students in there and uh, we housed about 1,700 high school kids in there. So there's a lot of space to grow depending on what we do with Huntley Middle School. There's a lot of parking, there's fields there, even without the 41 acres. So there's still room for a lot of growth in, in that school. So without having long plans over there, looking towards the future 10 or 15 years, which I don't know if anyone can speculate here what's gonna happen at the new high school, but I can tell you if you drive up there with already 1,800 students, I can't imagine with 2,500, someone's not gonna find good use to property around the new high school if the land swap occurred. So, um, what had happened um, we, we contacted Shodin, we contacted Dave, and we started sitting down to talk about the present agreement. I don't know if all of you are aware of it, but there was an agreement with Macon who owned that development up there, and they sold it to Shodin. And that agreement transferred to Shodin. So the district still had to continue that agreement. And the key components, we believe, as a school district that impact us in that agreement was that the school district owes a million uh, dollars, a little over a million dollars in impact fee credit to Shodin. Now, that wasn't a, a bad deal. What that was, was the property was sold at $40,000 an acre where we build our new high school. So the district spent 25,000 in cash and 15,000 um, for impact fee credit. Instead of paying the $40,000 cash up front, the district paid 25,000 and a $15,000 credit. Hence, uh, we owe the developer a million dollars in credit, in impact fee credit. Also, in the agreement, is starting in 2013, the school district owes 4% on that million dollar credit if nothing happens out there. Finally, in the agreement, when Shodin Development decides to build up by the new high school, we get recapture fees for the lights and the roads and the infrastructure that we put in that we would share. So we would actually get reimbursed 654,000 is what we believe it would be. And we did work with Dave to come up with that number. So those are really the, the big parts of the agreement. Now here are some facts <coughs> that it's this is really critical for the community to realize. Because I know this impact fee is a big issue. but. There has been little or no construction in DeKalb County since 2008. If anyone in the room knows of any, I'd 
we really need to know, but there has been no development, which, which really translates into no EAV growth, and that is critical to the district. Everyone's seeing EAV sliding, tax rates going up, the district's still getting their money. That is not good. So that's, that's really a critical point to remember in this process. The other thing we did is we needed to figure out a creative way because working with Dave, the, the idea of, of any developer, in, in back in 07, 08, you were building homes left and right and impact fees weren't an issue. Now there aren't any developments going on and impact fees makes it difficult for any developer to come in and say, oh sure, I'll pay this much money for every home. So we needed to come up with a creative way to put a trigger point in this process to protect the taxpayer, protect the school district. And we actually assessed how many student seats we have in the school district. Right now in this present grade configuration, and we estimate 1,200 seats are available from kindergarten through high school. And it's a pretty close estimate. So I want you to keep that in mind. So here, other fact, we're sitting on 41.6 acres, again, I'm going to reiterate that point, with no long-term plan in the future. We know DHS is already landlocked, so there's no room for expansion. School district's not in a financial position to just spend cash on land. That's a fact. In 2013, we start paying 4% on a million dollars, which is 40000 annually. And we know the equalized assessed valuation is decreasing, which has a huge impact on our taxpayers and our tax base. These are all facts in, in probably any community, but these are our facts in the agreements we have. And I'll tell you, without EAV growing or even attempting to grow it, it, it it's going to have a serious impact on our district as we go. So these are facts. So with that in mind, we're working with Dave. And here's the tentative agreement we came up with. The board asked us to work with Dave Patzel and Shodin, and we did. And tonight I'm here because I feel like we came to a tentative type of key point agreement on how to proceed if the board would give us the permission to move forward into a legal, make it a legal document. And here's basically what it is. If we did this land swap, Shodin Development picks up the 41.6 acres over by Fairview. We would, we would tell him that here's the deal. We have 1,200 seats in the district. Your trigger point, if you don't pay any impact fees, your trigger point is 600 students. If 600 students in either the Fairview, if he decides to develop the Fairview or the Iron Gate, at 600 students, that's a trigger point, then we sit down and impact fees have to start. 600 students or seven years. So that, that would be our part of the agreement. And then also he, the show game would be expected to file, to, to comply to all the city decal ordinances, of course, is an agreements that we have between the school district and intergovernmental agreements. The school district, if this went through, would pick up the 33.46 acres at DHS. Now let's be exact on this. Andrew, help me out a little bit. We, we originally had how many acres? 75. 75. And when Shodin took over the development, we purchased another 4.3 4.3 acres. And if you add the 33, that puts us at approximately 113 acres. 80. No. Oh, with the, with the 33, yes. we put us at 113 acres with the opportunity to expand for either educational related programs and if needed facilities. We would not, Dave agreed that we would no longer have to pay the 4% on the million dollars if we did this land swap. And finally, when the development begins, we would get $654,000 within the agreement we would work that out. So those are the, there's, there's a little, you know, there's a lot of little details obviously but the Board of Education asked us to sit down with Dave and Shodin and try to come to an agreement. And, and obviously, there's no denying the, the impact to getting this deal done was right here. But we feel as a district we're, that it's very responsible to tie, to, to tie students, which is something you can measure, because I don't think anyone here can speculate on land or speculate how many houses you're going to build. I don't think anyone's going to be able to do that. But we know 
that if we get to 600 students, there's got to be some some cash starting to flow into the district. So, is that it? I think that's it. So, with that said, I want to thank Tracy Williams and Michael Lord and Andrew Gorla. They all work with me and Dave, and I would like to provide them an opportunity to to probably add anything I might have missed. The only thing, Jim, and I think maybe just an oversight, but your second bullet point uh, for what the school district receives, uh, there's an eight acre difference, and then we would be reimbursed $15,000 uh, an acre for those eight acres, right. which was Carrie's point earlier. Right. So that, that, that would be another thing that would come towards the district. And that was up there, but it was up there. You just, you just <coughs> didn't mention that in your, in your discussion. So. Good. Thanks for bringing that up. But I don't know if Michael, Tracy, or Andrea have any additional comments. We work pretty hard at this. Um, I feel like this is very responsible on the district part, and I feel like none of us here will know, but I believe in 15, 20 years, someone's going to think, thank God they did that. But that's Jim Bristol's personal opinion. So. I don't know if Tracy or Michael or Andrea have anything to say. I think what I'd like to do is, um, if any of the other board members have questions for, for Dr. Briscoe or, or for Dave while he's here tonight, and now's a good opportunity to do that. Uh, this will also be presented again tomorrow night to our Finance Facilities Committee at that particular meeting. Uh, so I know there'll be more robust discussion at that. And Carrie, that's an interactive meeting, so you'll be able to express your opinions very freely at that. Uh, but uh, are there are there questions here from, from any of our board members? Um, I know FFAC will be presented on this, but I remember the city having discussions or input on this as well. From my understanding, is that regardless, this agreement is independent of them or no? Uh, Dave, maybe can you address your plans of going to the city? I don't know if I quite heard the response. Did you ask the status of the city? Yeah, like what is their input on it? Like is this independent of them or are they going to be brought in on this? The, the Should city, they be brought in on uh, uh, Yes, the city will need to be brought into the, uh, the discussion. Uh, but what is key before that discussion actually takes place, there has to be a, an agreement between uh, the two property owners, the school district and, uh, and the developer. Mm -hmm. So once that agreement is uh, solidified, we'll then jointly approach, uh, approach the city. And uh, different items that need to have discussions with them is one, uh, if you recall, the, the property, the 30, uh, 30 plus or minus acres that uh, Dr. Crystal has referred to, needs to be annexed and zoned uh, in, with the city, uh, city ordinances so that it can be used for uh, for school purposes. So that's an example of an item that needs to be discussed with the city. If we are going to uh, acquire the uh, Fairview, uh, Fairview property, we're not in the school business right now. It's the mm -hmm. purpose for being used for uh, parks and schools. We need to change the zoning on, uh, on, that, on, on that property. So to answer your question, yes, the city will be brought in, but not until there's an agreement between the two, uh, between the two property owners, Shogin and, uh, and the school district. One last question, just to be clear. So, if we have an agreement with each other, the city is not like they can over. The only thing they'd be doing is zoning. They wouldn't be able, say, for instance, to not approve this. They don't uh, have. There would be a uh, in the agreement I, uh, that we would have between the two of us. It would there be a what I'll refer to as a kickout clause. That in the event that we have an agreement, mm -hmm. but let's uh, as an example, not that the city would do this. Let's say that the city does not want to annex or zone. The, the 30 acres for school, uh, the school district would have a kickout clause that would say the deal is off because we can't uh, we can't obtain right. the, uh, the zone. Okay. So. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Mike. Dave, would there be <coughs> any other? Would you look to us to share any other responsibilities as far as road, traffic light? I guess my concern is it's it's great to grow the, the piece of property, but now us growing that property, will there be the, the, the roads and sewer lines, water, that kind of thing that we will have to, again, partner on, much like we partner going into this project, or are we avoiding that with this agreement? Uh, we, as part of this agreement, we have decided that where we drew, drew the lines previously with the shared cost on the traffic signal, 
roadway costs, we're leaving those as is and we're not changing any of those uh, elements of the, uh, of the agreement. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, Dr. Briscoe and I, uh, just so the uh, park district will not wake up and uh, see this in the paper, as a courtesy, we did have a sit down with uh, Cindy Capek, their executive director, to explain this. Uh, we have an intergovernmental agreement with them. They take care of the yard, the, the grass, and, and so forth over there, maintain that for the AOSO programs. Uh, Dr. Briscoe also met with the AOSO board on Friday just to inform them and uh, reassured them that uh, uh, we would be a uh, working uh, partner with them to, to help accommodate their needs, and uh, they seemed very receptive. Very receptive yeah. to that. And I think they, there also is an understanding that you know the school district. Uh, this has been part of our part of our inventory of assets, and, and I think everyone will eventually something like this was was bound to uh, occur and be recommended. So, but but just for public record, we have that uh, just information FYI to those two groups. And the city also, I have kept uh, Mark Bernanke informed of, of what we're working on. So the city, park district, and so understand what's going on. Any other questions? Discussion? Mike? Just a concern on the strip uh, adjacent to uh, the Chilton's property. Uh, it's a small strip that uh, you can't see from the building. My concern is oversight of that parcel. Um, how do we uh, look over that when we can't even see it? It's, it's so far from the building. Uh, I understand we think it could be useful someday, but I'm thinking of today, and uh, how do we keep an eye on that corner and or perhaps it turns into an intersection? I'm not sure. I don't have an answer for you. Yeah, I just look at it and wonder how do we go. Uh, what I would just ask is if by nodding of heads, uh, if we bring this back as an informational uh, possible action item at the next meeting, uh, I think a lot of that would depend on discussion that would occur uh, with our FFAC group tomorrow night and feedback that we get from that group. But uh, for my information, I probably keep it on the agenda so people can discuss it and so forth as well. Jim? No, I was thinking of the timeline here too. I, I suspect what will happen is, um, you know, obviously the community will be aware of it and you guys will get more feedback. Mm -hmm. But um, my hope was tonight is I would get um, approval to move forward towards uh, a more formal agreement that you could all look at in advance, not like I wouldn't bring it to you for formal action. I, I would ask your permission to work with Dave to get a more formal agreement that everyone here can get their um, arms around, take a look at. And then the timeline I would look at is you can continue discussion, but we have a board meeting on the 15th, which most likely probably we wouldn't be able to, you know, have our attorneys involved and all that. But then we have a board meeting in November that we could shoot for <coughs> to actually approve an agreement um, if we're there. You know, there or, or at least the first of December. But to get to that, move towards that direction, I'm asking for your permission to work with Dave on a legal agreement with the things we shared tonight. I would support that. So I think what you're recommending is bring back for a discussion next meeting and formal action if if it's decided to do that in the November meeting. Uh, and I'm comfortable with Jim no development or formal agreement in the process. Dave, do you want any comments? No, nothing okay. further. Very good. Appreciate you coming. Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we're going to move on to uh, presentation. I know Jessica, you were asking for this information earlier. Connie, you're going to talk a little bit about the uh, new employee demographics. We're going forward with that. Thank 
too much. Um, basically, I just wanted to give you an update on our hiring for the 2012-13 school year. And um, one of the reasons that we kind of broke down the information the way we did is to focus the HR department on our future hiring process. So the first thing that we looked at were, um, first of all, there were um, 89 new employees hired district-wide. That is brand new employees to the district. That does not include people who switched roles within the district, and we did have a lot of that um, happen through this school year. And of um, those 89, 67 were female and 22 were male. Then we broke it down by race, and we chose um, white, Hispanic, and black, because those are the three largest races represented by our student population. So with our hiring, you can see that 79 of the people were white, two were Hispanic, and eight were black. I did pull the data from last year, uh, as far as our staff and students were concerned, and last year on our school report card, 59% of the students are, were white, 13% black, and 21% Hispanic. Of our staff last year, 93% were white, 2% black, and 4% Hispanic. When I figured the percentages based on this, um, this year it was 89% white, 9% um, black, and 2% Hispanic. Next we look at, at the buildings just to see where the majority of the hiring took place this school year. And you can see the majority of the hiring did take place at DHS. When you look at that as a whole, that is the largest staff that we have, followed then by Huntley, Portland, and Rosette and Founders, which then are our next four largest buildings. So as far as a pattern, you know, our people leaving unproportional, we did not seem to find one when we broke it down by building. Um, next, we did break it down by race, because over 40 is a protected class for those of us who are in there. And 23 um, of the new hires were over 40, and then, you know, 66 were another. Then the last thing we looked at were actually positions that were hired this year. And you can see that the assistants had the highest number. Um, so we kind of looked at that a little more to see why that was. And in the spring, there was a reduction in forts of 32 people in that group. Ironically, 32 people were hired for that particular group this year. Um, we did do a recall and we did um, offer jobs back to all 32 that were um, let go. Some took the job back, some did not because they had gotten positions elsewhere. So the difference then, or the reason the number is the exact same, is because um, we ourselves as a district hired six of our instructional assistants from the previous school year as teachers this year. And then in addition, we have had some additional new FTE added to our assistant group based on um, IEP needs and students. Yes? Connie, approximately how many assistants do we have district-wide? Yeah. Uh, over 150. Okay. I didn't mean to throw you off. Nope, that's okay. That's what, that's what Jessica's here because she knows that. So, and then you can also look, um, the next highest one was our coaching staff. And that um, is a combination when I looked at not only head coaches but also assistant coaches, which seems to be some um, changing done there. And then it goes down to our um, teachers. And, I found it interesting that elementary, high school, and middle was really close. We had 10 at the high school, 10 at the middle school, and 9 elementary wide. <coughs> and then the other different areas. So that's basically it in a nutshell. Um, however, looking at this data, what the HR department has talked about is where we need to focus our hiring process. And we've talked about the fact that if you look at our genders, we're pretty disproportionate with our males and females, as well as within our race. It's pretty disproportionate and it does not match the demographics of our students. So we talk a lot about, we see it as being a two-fold process. The first is our recruiting process. We need to do a better job of recruiting um, minorities as well as males in the, in the field, especially in the <coughs> teaching. You know, currently we advertise using the DeKalb County ROE, that's where we post all of our job openings. And so we need to explore other options to get out there to recruit um, people to apply to the district. 
Um, another aspect that we talked about is we really need to do a better job of selling not only DeKalb, the district, to minorities as well as to um, males that are in the education field, but as well as the community. What does the community have to offer in addition? Um, after we look at that and come up with a plan, we'll come back and let you know what our goal is and how we're going to achieve that re um, recruiting, but also do it within our limited budget. And then the next part of that would then be to look at our interview process and how we're actually um, doing our interviews and getting some more consistency maybe in the interview process. Dr. So, so. Briscoe? Yeah, Con Connie and I talked a little bit about this and, and uh, you know, I know the district's been on cash, but one of the things I think we, we're probably going to have to seriously look at doing is looking at minority colleges and possibly sending a team um, during the recruiting time. And when we say recruiting, we're recruiting people to come to interview for the position. And so the concept is we increase the candidates and balance the candidates that are coming in to interview that we feel we can change and balance the trend to look more like our student population. So we may look at um, moving our resources around so we can send teams to minority campuses, uh, teaching colleges, to see what we can do to attract them to come to DeKalb. And, and I, I think we just need to take that step. Are there any questions? Quick. Yeah, Michael. We're talking about recruiting people coming in and going to the college. Do you see that primarily affecting those 29 teachers? Did right. you break it down, the same information for our teachers only as opposed to the entire staff? Yes. So, so I, that, I mean, I, we didn't, but I can. Because I'd, I'd like to, you know, to me that's important because they're the ones, you know, that are teaching our kids. and. Everybody's interacting with our students, right. but that's the one I think that we're focused on a lot of the past. And when we were talking about the recruitment, we were talking to the teaching staff. Right. The teaching staff more. Could you email that out to us? I can, yes, yeah. definitely. Yeah. The only thing I was thinking is that um, looking at the disparity with the hires by gender, um, I'd be interested to know if you have the same type of disparity in the schools, those who are in teacher education. There are yeah. always many more women than men. Right. You know, I can tell you just because I'm coming from the elementary setting that when we looked um, previous years as elementary principals, the number of male teachers we had in elementary was very low. Cool. So that is definitely when we talk about recruiting. We, you know, unfortunately, it seems like men go into education, they want to do secondary, but definitely really getting that recruitment if you are elementary <coughs> male, come to DeKalb, we've got wonderful things to offer, wonderful programs. But well, we can break that down too. Well, Connie, thank you so much for giving us the presentation. I really appreciate that. And now, if you answer my ask my question, I just basically wanted to know what the numbers are they included? Like, are you looking at all positions with that? My other question was, um, I'm sorry. Oh. The people coming back, you talked about the assistant, mm -hmm. but were the teachers included in that <coughs> new hire? Is that included in no, that? No, any of the teachers that were like, for example, the pre K teachers, mm -hmm. um, because of not knowing the grant, they were riffed like during the yeah. program. They are not included, They're not included, not included, included as a new hire. These okay. are brand new people. We also had, like I said, um, at least six people move from an assistant category into a teacher category that did not move. We have a couple of assistants moved into the custodial category. We did not do any of that yet. We were just brand new people to our school district in any capacity. So, and in addition, uh, you know, to the teaching thing, the other thing that we looked at um, for the race was kind of the coaching staff as well, it, as well as the gender. We have a really you know, low number of female coaches within our secondary programs, as well as minorities. So will we be seeing a strategic plan in the future? That is our goal, yes. Before the hiring procedure, you know, process starts and season happens, that is our plan. John, this last year, Multicultural Committee asked to help with that. They talked about bringing in a value, a value piece uh -huh. to there to basically look at um, diverse, you know, asking questions. Right. Because again, it wasn't so much about race. But it was that understanding of the student, meaning that you can be any race and be a great teacher, but do you have that cultural understanding and that value piece to it? Right. We had a pretty pretty long discussion, a couple of meetings, about um, the types of questions that are asked our candidates and how to weight those questions. And so um, 
um, there are a couple people who have that research base background on that that we can work with that are on our own. Thank you. Any other? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm Supplemental Education Service Contracts, Information item. <coughs> Dr. Muller. Very straightforward. Um, this is our second year where we're required to offer supplemental, uh, supplemental educational services to our students at uh, both Tyler Elementary and um, Jefferson Elementary. So there's a incredible bureaucratic process involved in this. And we're at the point now where we just got the contracts, the deadline for contracts, for uh, providers to send their contracts to us was last night, yesterday at 5, 5 p.m. So uh, we're, we're vetting through those right now, making sure that they, it's a standardized BAE contract, the same contracts that were approved last year. Okay. And um, so at the next board meeting, we'll have the actual list of uh, providers that uh, who adequately filled out their applications. And then um, once it's approved by the board, then we get the letters out to parents and uh, providing them descriptions in both English and Spanish of the services <coughs> each of the providers provide, and then um, then the parents can select from there. Now, some of these, right now, we're looking at about 15 to 18 contracts that have come back in under the deadline. We started initially with over 90, some we had to solicit, so it's been a bit of a lengthy process, but we're getting down to where, where we should have, after the board approves the contracts that week, if that's, that's, that's the action is taken, um, we can then, Move forward and get the letter up from parents about the services. Michael, do you have the data from last year as to know how many students chose each one of these different supplemental? There providers? was only uh, last year we only had six that, that actually went through the process. This year there's a, and, there, and of those six, there's only three that, that actually um, were were in the schools working with our kids because um, some of the some of the providers if they didn't have enough numbers of students that, that selected them, they they. Oh to turn turn away now this year what we're seeing is a trend where there's a lot more online providers we've got companies from california that want to offer online services so yeah we haven't gone through this process last year Any question yes yeah, so go with the same question except change the demographic group you have providers how many students do you know actually utilize the services last year there were about 80 80 some students 80 students and, this and they year. have to be, and they have to be um, in, in, in the two schools. <coughs> well, last year, Little John was a, a third school um, that was off, SES was offered to. This year, it was not um, because of their status change. Um, so, I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, which school this year? Tyler and Jefferson. And uh, these these uh, services are only afforded to students who are on a free or reduced price lunch. The questions for <coughs> Dr. Moore. We'll look forward to seeing that next meeting. Thank you. Yeah. All right. The annual application for recognition is a procedural thing that we need to do. Right. We can't uh, send them to the state without writing down on the board for them. It's so it's been recommended that action taken in the Board of Education approve the 2012-13 application for recognition of schools for each school in the district. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. second. Roll call, please. Jessica Lyons? Yes. Tom Matia? Yes. Jack Burbick? Yes. Casey Williams? Yes. Tom Barnes? Yes. Montana? Yes. Michael Lord? Yes. Uh, Motion passes. Uh, I apologize before we go into agenda building. Uh, it was left off. Uh, I did not catch it. The committee reports. Let's. That's so. Sorry, I didn't catch it. Uh, but uh, I'd like to open that up. If anyone has a report, uh, I'll, I'll kick it off. Uh, we, uh, myself, Nina, Colin. Um, that's it. We last uh, Thursday night. Uh, we attended the Kishwaukee Division uh, of the Illinois uh, School Boards. Um, we hosted at our new high school. Um, so, you know, schools from all over Northern Illinois that were there, board members, some of their superintendents. Uh, the highlight of the evening for me 
was the presentation by our a cappella group and our jazz band. Uh, the meeting itself is rather dry. But the food was good by uh, uh, Chartwell, our food service company. And uh, but our students really shine, and uh, we got some tremendous comments. First, about our facilities. Uh, uh, the new head of the uh, of the, uh, the school association was there. Very, very impressed. Very complimentary of the school and of our uh, children who participated. And uh, I just you would have, I know everyone can't always be there, but you would have been proud of, uh, of how the. Uh, Students perform, and uh, and also our National Honor Society, Honor Society students were there to give tours uh, to people that wanted those. And I gave a lot of the tours before the before the finish even started, so it was pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, other reports that anyone has? I uh, um, attended. Well, DEF is a great group this year. I mean, it's just amazing how motivated these yeah. people are. Really yeah. are so. Education Foundation. Yes, yes. the Cal Education <clears throat> Foundation. Um, I also uh, attended the tech math class. I don't know if there's an official term for it or not, but where uh, students at Huntley and Clinton Rosette actually attend a math class virtually that's being taught by instructor at the high school. And it was fascinating to sit down and watch how that works and the dynamic. Um, some work to do there, classroom management, things like that. But I got to applaud the district administration and staff for really let's take a step forward, let's figure out how to offer additional services to kids without having to get them in a bus, ship them off somewhere, which is additional cost, but I think more importantly, reduce time for the kids in the classroom. Um, so I think that's fantastic. I'd let uh, uh, Paul borrow a different kind of camera that hopefully will be able to get the kids to see more of the room, engage with the instructor a little bit more, so we will be curious to see how that evolves. Um, so that was neat. And then uh, I attended, I don't know what we're called, tech committee, Technology Strategic Planning Committee. There you go. Yeah. Um, met with uh, Doug, uh, Brian. Uh, Who else? Denise Fleming. Oh, well, Denise was there, yeah. Um, just talking about what technology looks like in the district going forward. Um, we were just throwing out there, like, what do we want it to look like in 2016? And starting having a conversation based off of that. And October 15th, yes. correct? Um, 15 to 20 uh, members of uh, uh, District 428. We're going to get together. I'm going to facilitate kind of a swap that we did uh, as a as a board, but just get feedback from teachers, administration across all aspects of the district, all grades, um, just to really get an idea of one what they'd like to see technology be for students in the classroom, um, but also I'm curious to see how we can utilize technology just from an operation standpoint. And looking at what we have, we've got a lot of the pieces. Of Place. We just don't have a real formal strategy established on how we can year by year start making some serious progress towards that. So that would be good. Um, curriculum Council is coming up a week from Thursday, and uh, Doug had sent me the uh, agenda. And because we're all interested in our math program at the high school, they're going to be proposing three new courses that they'll be discussing at uh, curriculum and then hopefully if they're passed, they'll come to the board. But they're going to be proposing, um, let's see, Honors Algebra 2, Geometry AB, and um, an elementary, I'm sorry, that's a different one. Uh, those two, they're just changing a, a name on another one. But, uh, you know, things are, are going into full gear right away with curriculum, with proposals coming up. Again, uh, we have to remember that we want to get some feedback eventually because otherwise we feel rushed as we all did last yes. year. Yes. Propose it so they can get into the course book. So. And that should be pretty much it. I mean, we were, we were uh, that's it very uh, mm -hmm. vocal about getting those in from the, from the various... Uh, in timely manner. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, in that regard, does that come up to the curriculum? as well where you talk about flux period and recommendation on that there was going to be a report um, by uh Schroeder at the november board meeting i believe we okay. scheduled for both flux period and update on the literacy program okay very good uh reminder i know carrie will be there uh for the rest of you facilities finance committee tomorrow night you know actually it's a working meeting and i 
think that happens Thursday, and then the following Wednesday, the 10th, is a regular meeting. Ah! Excuse me, so Thursday. Right. Um, I encourage everyone to be there. Um, it's a good discussion, and, and I think we're getting ready to close the off the beer a couple of things here. They've done a lot of work on, uh, uh, you know, student numbers, consolidation facilities, true numbers of, of a lot of concepts we've been talking about. So I encourage anyone that can make it to make it. And Andrea, maybe work with Dave to make sure we get uh, good public awareness of the date. So there's no confusion yes. on that, and that'd be really good. Okay, Dave. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was afraid of flags. We were there, um, the homecoming parade. Also, Jonathan was there last Wednesday. I wasn't able to go because of class, but I hear it was an amazing event um, having him there. Also, Saturday, lots of fun. The Bengals were actually, the DYFL Bengals was actually able to play at the high school. So it was amazing for the experience for the kids to be able to be there. And I, I sit there all day, but it was a lot of fun and they got to see everything. The troubles of having four kids. But, uh, you know, but yes, they were all excited about being able to utilize the high school. I apologize for doing this, but I think we have a little confusion about, I sent out a note to the board about changing our potential next meeting mm -hmm. because uh, it's the 25th, it's scheduled to be on the 16th, that is the 25th anniversary of the Bell County Economic Development Corporation, and some of us are pretty pretty involved in that and, and need to attend that, and three of us right here, um, and I believe um, Michael, you could not make it on Monday, the 15th, is that correct? Mm -hmm. And Jessica, you can't make it. Monday, but have class. How about, so could we move it to Wednesday? I, I, class. I think we, we formally approved <laughs> the change to Monday. 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 We agreed yeah. on a Monday, and so we formally approved it about a month ago. Okay. Yeah, but we, you know, we could change it again. I mean, we could, we could do that. Yeah. You, you, I mean, as a board, if it's, um, are there things that we could delay it until possibly the Tuesday, the 23rd? Because that's a good night for you, Jessica, Michael, depending on who the girls are doing. Right. <laughs> but I think we can't, we got we to set a meeting. Uh, if we have two people can't make Mondays and Wednesdays. Uh, I guess I would entertain a motion to change it to uh, our next school board meeting be Tuesday, October 23rd. So moved. So moved. We have a second. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Very good. Thank you. Sorry about that. No, no, no. Sorry. Thank you. Um, the one other thing I'd just like to mention, speaking of DCEDC, I attended one of their meetings. A couple of the uh, members there expressed frustration with uh, having enough good employees to come out of high school trained in the areas of, of, uh, of uh, working like at a uh, manufacturing plant like uh, Drive Lock with Gary Seegers, and, and, and others expressed similar frustrations. And they talked about some programs to the east of this and so forth. So uh, I just, since I sit on that committee, I took it upon myself to introduce Gary Seegers, Paul Borg, to um, Tamron up at high school, and Dave Elliott, uh, technology instructor up there. Because Dave tells me the classes are full. Uh, and, uh, but it just seems like the right hand's not talking to the left too really well. So uh, Tamron had to leave, but uh, uh, I think she might be bringing some things, uh, which I don't think is going to cost us any money, but just talking about plans of action in which we can enhance this. Because I think one of the things we really want to do is make sure, you know, our students are are ready and capable to go to those, you know, keep, keep our students here to go and, uh, as many as we can. So just wanted to pass that along, that that might be something that comes out now. Uh, any other items for agenda building? 
Mike? Uh, month in, uh, attendance rates from all buildings would be great. Okay. That's good. Um, Chartwell, see how that is doing. Um, the feedback from students about because we have the new vendor. Um, Actually, uh, I think in November. Okay. Thank you. Um, Algebra X, we could bring that back to the table. I know that was the things are being looked at, but if we can revisit that. Could again. we bring it to your curriculum first, please? Well, yes. If we can, mm -hmm. the board asked that to be done for curriculum council to bring so back it's, Algebra X so to discuss that. again. Um, a lot of people, especially from what I hear at NIU, is getting around about the algebra test, and there's some concerns about it. Are you talking about the algebra one, algebra A, B? We yes. Or algebra A, B, we don't yes. have, yes. Um, to bring that back, because I know we have now geometry A, B. No, that's what, that's one of the proposals. Proposals. So that was why it came up, is because that was coming up. And how does that look with algebra A and B? How does that affect the students for college? How does that affect the students? I think, um, did you all get that, uh, I sent out uh, of all the presentations, uh, we're, at, we're, we're scheduled to talk about Algebra AB in February mm -hmm. because we want to wait to look at wait, look the first semester grades and look at the first semester grades between our, the aggregate our Algebra and Algebra A, our Algebra A students versus our, what, what we had last year was only Algebra. So far it's looking very good. In fact, um, the first two exams when we aggregated the test scores, Last year we had a 73 percent average score. This year was 84 percent score, and the uh, the pass rate is, is, is doing significantly better. So I anticipate we're going to see a much higher overall uh, pass rate. But, but we really want to wait till first semester to get uh, some concrete data on that. Is it possible we can have a, the Education Council look at that again, please? Curriculum. Yes, yeah. curriculum. Doug. Yes. Okay. Good. Nina, you sit on that page. Okay. Just go on. I don't know if it's dangerous or if it's pertinent to the agenda building, but I'd love to know more about what the ROE does uh, for the district and what the costs are associated with the ROE. It seems like every time I turn around, either someone's commenting on it or it's in the paper. Or, and I'd just like to have a better understanding of that organization. Dr. Briscoe, will you get a report on that? Yeah. Very good. Jim, some more jobs here? <laughs> I'm awesome. <laughs> yeah, I know you're. Um, okay. Um, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, Roger and Tim, thanks for coming. Uh, I think one of the next meetings uh, we'll have uh, uh, maybe some quick reports on how things are going in and so forth. I really appreciate being here this evening. So, thank you. I said we have the two tallest middle school principals. They both came walking in. I go, hi, guys.